So I welcome everybody and uh, again, happy Sabbath. And I, I trust that we will receive a, a blessing today as we go through, through God's word. And I'm going to share a sermon today that some of you have probably already heard. I, I think I presented it at Box Hill in the, the physical church there about, I don't know, three or maybe even longer now, four, four or something years ago. And I think many, many of you were there, but some of you aren't, weren't. And I'd like to actually have this up on the, um, as a video presentation on the, uh, the website as well. So I thought I'd, I'd share this with you today and um, then other people can watch it on, on our website as well. So before we start, shall we uh, kneel in prayer and ask the Lord to bless us in our study today? Our Father in heaven, we just come before your throne of grace this morning and we thank you so much, Father, for the, another beautiful Sabbath that you've blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together as your children and worship you in spirit and truth and in, in fellowship with one another, even though we're on Zoom, we can still talk and see each other, dear Lord, and we thank you for that, this opportunity. And we thank you, Father, for Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us in coming to this earth to live and to die for us and to reveal your character to this world and to us, dear Lord. We thank you for your word and the spirit of prophecy, which give us light and understanding, especially concerning the things that are happening in the world today and, and even in your church. We, we thank you that you've revealed these things to us so we don't need to be in darkness. And I pray, Lord, as we have this time together in our study, that you will bless us and give us wisdom and understanding and help us to see your, your plan for our salvation and and your plan and, and your revealings to us through your words and through your prophets. And so, Lord, we just pray that you'll bless us now as we open up your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, share my screen. Okay, so the title on my message this morning is called, sorry, From Eden to Eden. From Eden to Eden. Okay, there are seven important events in the history of the world. All these seven events, except the first and the last, as similar characteristics. At the end of the study, we will look at two important points, one for non-Seventh-day Adventists and the other for Seventh-day Adventists. So in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So again, the title of my message, From Eden to Eden. So we have the beginning which is a new earth in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth so god created the earth to be inhabited isaiah 45 verse 18 god created man to have dominion on the earth genesis 1 verse 26 and 27 and god gave the earth to the children of men Psalm 115 and verse 16. Okay, so we've got a line here and we're going to look at all these different periods or events in the history of the world. So the first one is Genesis 2 verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. So God created the Garden of Eden. So here we have Eden. Now, when God created man, he said he called their name Adam in the day when they were created. 
So mankind was called Adam. And so here we have Adam or, or mankind. Now, in Genesis 3, verse 8, it says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in a garden in the cool of the day. So every day, God would walk or meet and talk with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So we have here worship or communion or, or fellowship with God. In Genesis 1, verse 31 to 2, verse 3, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So here we see that God made the Sabbath. And the Bible says the Sabbath was made for man. So God created the Sabbath for man. So here we see worship and the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden. Now we know that Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And we know its results. But God did not leave man helpless. Before God drove them out of Eden, he explained to Adam and Eve the plan of salvation. Excuse me, I need to drink some water. God explained to Adam and Eve the plan of salvation. And in Genesis 3, verse 15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 67, we read this. Thus were revealed to Adam important events in the history of mankind. From the time when the divine sentence was, was pronounced in Eden to the flood, and onward to the first advent of the Son of God. So here we see these events being revealed to Adam. So the Bible says God drove out the man and placed in the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So at the gate of the Garden of Eden, there were cherubims. Okay, now what took place at that gate of the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from his pleasant paths. At the cherubim guarded gate of, the par of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. Here they renewed their vows of obedience to that law the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. So here we see that Adam and his sons and his descendants came to worship God at the Garden of Eden. So here we see the worship of God at the Garden of Eden. Now we're going to go to the next event in history of mankind. And in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 85, it says, Through holy angels, God revealed to Enoch his purpose to destroy the world by a flood. So God already showed um, Adam that the world would be destroyed by a flood. And then he also showed Enoch that the world would be destroyed by a flood. God also showed Enoch about the second coming of Jesus as well, as we know in, Jude chapter, in, in the book of Jude. Okay, now let's move on. So God saw man's wickedness and gave them 120 years, to, which was in Genesis 6, verse 3. God said he would bring a flood to destroy the earth, Genesis 6, 13 and 17. And God called Noah to warn the world and build an ark, 
Genesis 6, 8, 9, and 14. So in Genesis 7 and verse 1, it says, The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And Ellen White says, When the tide of iniquity overspread the world, and the wickedness of men determined their destruction by a flood of waters, the hand that had planted Eden withdrew it from the earth. So when the flood was coming upon the earth, or just before it was coming, God withdrew the Garden of Eden from the earth, and he took it up to heaven. So he basically dug a big hole and transported that big lump of earth up to heaven. And therefore the Garden of Eden and that cherubim guarded gate was no longer there for man to worship God. And then the flood came. Now after the flood came, God said God was going to remove his place of worship from the earth and destroy the earth with the flood. Now where would God's place of worship be then after the flood? Now, Genesis 8, verse 15 and 16, it says, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and my son and my son's wives with thee. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Genesis 8, verse 20 and 21. So all the patriarchs worship God at an altar. Abraham, we see Genesis 12, verse 8. Isaac, Genesis 26, verse 25. And Jacob, Genesis 33, verse 20. So the next place of worship was an altar. So, and that began with Noah. Obviously, Adam and that worship God an altar, but they worshiped the altar at the um, the garden of at the gate of the Garden of Eden. Now, in Exodus 16, verse 28 to 29, the Lord said, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was kept from Adam up until Noah. And after the flood, the Sabbath was kept from Noah up until the children of Israel went into captivity. And they were no longer able to keep the Sabbath. Even though they knew the Sabbath, they were not able to keep the Sabbath while they were in captivity in Egypt. Okay, so the next period we're going to look at is that God told Abraham that his people would be slaves for 400 years. Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. When the 400 years were ending, God called Moses to deliver Israel. We find that in Exodus verse, or chapter 3. Now, in Exodus 3, verse 12, it says, When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. So God was going to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, and they were going to go to Mount Sinai, and there they would serve God, or they would worship God for a period of time. Now, when they were at the mountain, or at Mount Sinai, what did God say to them? God told the Israelites to build a sanctuary that he may dwell among them. Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9. Now, the pillar of cloud would cover the tabernacle and God's glory filled the tabernacle. So there God would dwell with the children of Israel. And there they would worship God. So God would meet or worship with his people there above the mercy seat. Exodus 25. Verse 22. So 
So in Leviticus 16, verse 2, God says, I will appear here in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Exodus 33, verse 10, it says, All the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. So here we see this is where they worship God. Now, obviously, we know the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we see here at Mount Sinai, God established his covenant with the children of Israel. He said, I will meet with you in the sanctuary and I also gave, gave you my Sabbath. Even though the Sabbath was already there, but God commanded them to keep the Sabbath in the fourth commandment. Now, after the children of Israel had settled in the land of Canaan, that God then promised David that his son Solomon would build the temple of the Lord. David wanted to build it himself, but God said, you can't because you're a man of blood because of what he did to Uriah. <coughs> and, but he said, your son will build my temple. So Solomon built the temple. And it says the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister the, by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. So here we see that the temple was now built and God's glory filled the cloud. And there the people would worship God at his temple in Jerusalem. In Psalm 5, verse 7, David says, but as, or not David, but as um, the psalm says, but as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear I will worship toward thy holy temple. Because of the Jews' sin, God's glory left Solomon's temple. Ezekiel 11, verse 23. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Second Chronicles chapter 36. Those who knew the difference after the second temple was built, in, um, after they returned from their exile in Babylon, and the second temple was built, those who knew the difference lamented over the second temple. We see that in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 3. But we read this in Prophets and Kings. Among the righteous still in Jerusalem, so, and sorry, my question is, what, what was the difference between Solomon's temple and the second temple? Among the righteous still in Jerusalem, to whom had been made plain the divine purpose, were some who determined to place beyond the reach of ruthless hands the sacred ark containing tables of stone on which had been traced the precepts of the Decalogue. This they did. With mourning and sadness, they secreted the ark in a cave where it was to be hidden from the people of Israel and Judah because of their sins and was to be no more restored to them. That sacred ark is yet hidden. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. So Ellen White says the ark of the covenant has been hidden and it's been that, that same spot right up until her time. But she also makes this statement in Bible commentary, page 1109. And he, Christ, gave to Moses when he had made an end of communicating with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written by the finger of God. Nothing written on those tables could be blotted out. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testament and is still there, safely hidden from human family. But in God's appointed time, 
He will bring forth these tables of stone to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship of a counterfeit Sabbath. So here God says those ten commandments that are in the Ark of the Covenant that are hidden in a cave somewhere are going to be revealed to mankind again when the Sunday law is, starts to be introduced around the world. And it will be a testimony against the idolatrous worship of uh, the counterfeit Sabbath, which we know as Sunday. Now, even though the, the people who saw the second temple were, were, were dismayed that it wasn't as glorious as the first because the Ark of the Covenant was there, God made a promise. And he said, I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory. So God prophesied that the desire of nations or, or the Messiah would come and fill that temple with his glory. And in Malachi 3 verse 1, it says, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> so the next phase was the earthly sanctuary and the temples. And the person that God raised up to bring this about was Moses. Now, in the, those temples, God said, you shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So the Sabbath and worship were part of these sanctuary services. Now we move on to the next phase. When the promise was to be fulfilled, God called John the Baptist, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. And in Mark 1, verses 9 to 11, we read this. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So now God himself had come to dwell among men in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, as a child, the messenger of the covenant, the desire of nations, Jesus came to his temple in Luke chapter 2. The Messiah taught and healed people in his temple in Matthew 21, verses 10 to 14. But Jesus said Israel would reject and betray their Messiah. And they would condemn him to be crucified. Because of this, Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed again. The temple never more to be rebuilt. Matthew 24, verse 1 and 2. So there will not be a third temple on this earth in Jerusalem. Remember that. Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now, Jesus said, oh, sorry, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So the reason why those sanctuary services were set up was a, to foreshadow or prefigure the death of the Son of God or the death of the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who was Christ. And he would take away the sin of the world. So once Christ died as a sacrifice for man, those sanctuary services were no longer necessary. In Matthew 27, verse 50 and verse 51, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, or he died. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. So when Jesus died, it signified the end of all the earthly sacrifices in the temple. In Desire of Ages, page 756 and 757, we read this. Below this veil is rent in twain. 
The most holy place of the earthly sanctuary is no longer sacred. All is terror and confusion. The priest is about to slay the victim, but the knife, knife drops from his nerveless hand and the lamb escapes. Type has met any type in the death of God's son. The great sacrifice has been made. The way into the holiest is laid open. A new and living way is prepared for all. No longer need sinful, sorrowing humanity await the coming of the high priest. Henceforth, the Saviour was to officiate as priest and advocate in the heaven of heavens. It was as a living voice had spoken to the worshippers. There is now an end to all sacrifices and offerings for sin. Amen, brothers and sisters. Praise God, Jesus Christ made that sacrifice for us. And in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, it says, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Okay, so we look at the worship now. And who is the one we, had to, we were to worship then? We are to worship Christ up until the cross. God himself was dwelling amongst us. And so people would worship Jesus in the, worship God in the flesh, as in worshiping Jesus in the flesh. And John the Baptist was the, the prophet that God raised up to pronounce the coming of Jesus. And in Luke 4, verse 16, we read that Jesus, as his custom was, went in on the Sabbath day into the synagogue and stood up to read. So did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Yes, he did. Okay, let's move on now to the next phase. Hebrews 8, verse 1 and 2. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So now we have, is revealed to us a heavenly sanctuary. So not only was there a sanctuary on earth, but there is a sanctuary in heaven. And remember, God said to Moses, make it according to the pattern. So a pattern is something that is already there that the sanctuary was made out of. Now, in uh, Hebrews 3, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So Jesus now became our high priest. So we still worship Jesus. We still worship God, the Father, and, and Christ. But we're no longer worshipping Jesus in the flesh as he was here on earth. We're now worshipping him as um, our high priest in heaven. In Hebrews 9, verse 11 and 12, it says, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So when Christ died and was resurrected and he ascended to heaven, he went into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So after his ascension, Jesus ministered as high priest in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. John saw God's throne or his glory, Revelation 4 and 5. He also saw seven golden candlesticks, Revelation 1, verse 12 and 13. He also saw the altar of incense, Revelation 8, verses 3 to 5. So in vision, John the prophet or John the Apostle and the prophet, he saw the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and Jesus ministering before there in, in that place. So now we 
we turn our worship to God, not to, to the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary for after Jesus died. That's where, where he was to be worshipped. And the apostle or the prophet that proclaimed that message was John the Apostle. And also we read Paul understood this as well. Now we move to the, oh, actually before that, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, what day is the Lord's day? We know the Lord's day is the, the Sabbath. Jesus says the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So the Lord's day is the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was also kept as a, when people worship. The Sabbath was also kept. Now let's move to the next phase of worship. Now remember, we're looking at where we worship God. So in the beginning, they worshiped God in Eden. Then it was at the family altar. And then it was the earthly sanctuary. And then when God was well amongst us, he, he manifested himself as, as, as Christ, the Son of God then people worship, were worshipping Jesus or worshipping God in, in person. And then when Jesus sent to heaven, they worshipped him in the heavenly sanctuary in the holy place. Now let's move on. Now we come forward in history to the 1830s. A man named William Miller began teaching that Jesus was going to return to earth in 1843. And we find this in Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So starting at the year 457 BC and adding 2,300 years takes us up to the year 1844 AD. I'm not going to go into all the history about how all this came about, but for those of us who are, are um, grounded Adventists, we understand how all this came about. Now, people concluded that at the end of that period of the 2,300 days would come on a specific date based upon the fall of the Jewish Day of Atonement, which was October 22, 1844. Now, no one, not even atheists or infidels, could dispute their calculations. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world, and in some countries, there was the greatest religious interest which had been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But they were disappointed because they believed that Jesus was going to come. The cleansing of the sanctuary was believed that the earth was the sanctuary and Jesus was going to come and cleanse the earth of sin. And that means he would take his people home. But they were disappointed. Jesus did not come. But something did happen on that day as a fulfillment of the prophecy. And what was that? Hebrews 9 verse 23 says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these things. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So there is to be a purification of the heavenly sanctuary or a cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Thousands who had accepted the message gave up their faith, but William Miller and others could not do that. Among these who remained faithful to the date were Alan White, James White, Hiram Edson, and O.R.L. Rosier. The next day, while walking through a field on the way to comfort believers who were gathered in a nearby house, Hiram Edson was given a vision. In his vision, he saw a sanctuary in heaven. And Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place 
of that sanctuary. When he arrived at the place of meeting, he related the vision to those present. Then he and Crozier went to the scriptures to see if the vision could be supported by the Bible. To their amazement, they found the answer to what happened on October 22, 1844. And in Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10, we read this. I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wills as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. And in verse 13 it says, I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. So Jesus indeed had moved from the holy place to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. So these two men searched the scriptures, and this phase of Christ's high priestly ministry was revealed to them in the scripture. Their findings were published in the February 7, 1846 edition of the Day Star. In Revelation 15, verse 5, it says, And after that, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. So after Revelation chapter 10, <coughs> excuse me, which is the end of the second woe, and which is a description of the, the, um, the Great Advent Movement of 1840 to 1844. After that, in Revelation 11, in Revelation 15, John now sees the Ark of the Covenant. Now, where was the Ark of the Covenant in the earthly sanctuary? It was in the most holy place. Now, before Revelation 10, John never saw the Ark of the Covenant. But after Revelation 10, he sees it. So he sees now that this temple is open, and now he sees the Ark of the Covenant. So after 1844, the most holy place was opened in heaven. The Ancient of Days, or the Father, moved in, and then Jesus followed him in, and then judgment was set, and the books were opened. Revelation 11, 19 says the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. So meanwhile, God was raising up a prophet that would lead his people through this period of um, the sanctuary being cleansed in the most holy place. This was prophesied in the Bible. Revelation 12, verse 17 says, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of the seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19 and verse 10. So this prophetic manifestation was first given to Hazen Foss and William Foy. Because of their refusal to give the message of the prophetic gift, sorry, the message, the prophetic gift was given to Alan G. Harmon or Alan G. White. Alan G. Harmon was given a vision in, in mid-February 1845. This vision was published in the March 13, 1846 edition of the Day Star. And this is what she saw. I saw a throne. And on it sat the Father and the Son. I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne. He left the throne. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire 
surrounded by angels, came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest, where the Father sat. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, it is interesting to note that the Bible study put together by Edson and Crozier had taken place before and after this vision of Ellen White. Neither of the two groups had any idea of what they were experiencing individually concerning the moving of Jesus into the most holy place. One year later, in March 1847, Ellen White said this, the Lord showed me in a vision more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary and that it was his will <clears throat> that Brother C should write out the view which he gave us in the Day Star Extra, February 7, 1846. I feel fully authorised by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. <clears throat> so the Bible study, the confirmation of the scriptures was first done before the vision was given to Alan White. So now we see at the next phase of where we worship God is the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And the prophet that God raised up to give that message is Alan G. White, or was Alan G. White. <clears throat> now let's move on. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So here we see another message going to the world to prepare people not only for the judgment that is here now, but for the second coming of Christ. <coughs> now, in First Testimonies for the Church, 76 and 77, we read this. The ark of God covered with the mercy seat. Two angels stood on either side of the ark with their wings spread over the mercy seat and their faces turned toward it. This my accompanying angel informed me represented all the heavenly hosts looking with reverential awe toward the law of God, which had been written by the finger of God. Jesus raised the cover of the ark, and I beheld the tables of stone on which the Ten Commandments were written. I was amazed as I saw the fourth commandment in the very center of the ten precepts with a soft halo of light encircling it. Now, why was Ellen White amazed? <clears throat> because before this she was a Sunday keeper and now as the light of the truth of the commandments and the ark and the heavenly sanctuary was being revealed to them the light concerning the fourth commandment was also revealed to them and they started keeping the Sabbath <clears throat> after Jesus opened the door of the most holy the light of the Sabbath was seen and the people of God were tested as the children of Israel were tested anciently <clears throat> to see if they would keep God's law. I saw the third angel pointing upwards, showing the disappointed ones the way into the holiest of the heavenly sanctuary. As they by faith entered the most holy, they find Jesus and hope and joy spring up anew. So the people were disappointed, but then God gave the message of the the most holy place ministry of Jesus now. And as people entered into that experience, they entered into the law of God and the keeping of the Sabbath as well. And we know the third, <clears throat> third angel represents a warning of worshipping the beast in his image and receiving his mark. And we know his mark is the Sunday Sabbath or the false Sunday Sabbath. <clears throat> so now we move on to the next phase in Revelation 16 verse 17 it says there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done 
The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Revelation 15 and verse 8. <clears throat> now Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. So there is a message that is to go to the world to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus. And when Jesus comes that second time, he's going to gather, gather, gather together his elect from all ages and from all over the world, and he's going to take them all back to heaven. <clears throat> And there they will live and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Now, Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again <coughs> and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Jesus promised that in his father's house, there are many mansions. He's going to come and receive us to himself that where he is, there we will also be. <clears throat> then after a thousand years, John says he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. So the holy city is going to come down upon this earth. And then in Revelation 21 verse 2, God says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So God himself <clears throat> is going to dwell upon the earth for eternity. So can you imagine this, brothers and sisters, how earth, this speck of the world, is going to basically become the place where God dwells and lives. Isn't that amazing? Just think of the privilege God is going to give the human race, that he and his angels are going to come and dwell and live here. You know, you see movies like Star Trek and Star Wars and all that, and, and all the <clears throat> everybody wants to leave this earth and go, travel in space and go to all these amazing places and you know and and the the cent center of the or the the government is going to be somewhere out there in the universe somewhere but god says no the my my center is going to be this earth and i am going to dwell with you so we don't need to leave this planet to go and find all these un all these different inhabitants of the universe because one day they're going to come here and and be with us isn't that amazing what a wonderful privilege god wants to give the human race and this planet now revelation 21 verse 22 says i saw no temple there for the lord god almighty and the lamb are the temple of it so god himself is going to dwell with us so we're not going to have to go to a temple to worship god we're not going to have to go to an altar to worship God. We're going to be worshiping God face to face here on this planet. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. In Revelation 22, verse 1 and 2, we see something else. We see God showed John a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Now, where was the tree of life in the beginning? It was in the Garden of Eden. And then the Garden of Eden was dug up 
and taken to heaven. And then again, the Garden of Eden is going to come back down with the new Jerusalem and be on earth again. I'd like to read to you now from the Great Controversy. And when I read this quote, for those of you who never heard my testimony on this, when I read this quote, I said to the Lord, I said, God, I don't care what you put me through on this earth. I probably shouldn't have said that. But I said, God, I don't care what you put me through on this earth. I want to go through the time of trouble. I want to be alive when Jesus comes back. And I, I want to see this event take place. And I cried when I read this. I, I, I just could not be, cried with joy. I, I just could not believe that this is going to happen. As the ransom ones are welcomed to the city of God, there rings out upon the air an exultant cry of adoration. The two Adams are about to meet. The Son of God is standing with outstretched arms to receive the Father of our race. The being whom he created, who sinned against his maker, and for whose sin the marks of the crucifixion are borne upon the Saviour's form. As Adam discerns the prince of the cruel nails, he does not fall upon the bosom of his Lord, but in humiliation casts himself at his feet. When was the last time <coughs> excuse me, Adam saw his Lord? He saw him in his innocency in Eden. He didn't have any marks on him. He didn't have any scars on his head or nails in his feet. He was perfect. Now he sees him with the marks and he realises what he's done for him. And he falls at his feet and humiliation in humiliation, crying, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Tenderly, the Saviour lifts him up and bids him look once more upon the Eden home from which he had so long been exiled. Transported with joy, he beholds the trees that were once his delight, the very trees whose fruit he himself had gathered in the days of his innocence and joy. He sees the vines that his own hands have trained, the very flowers that he once loved to care for. His mind grasps the reality of the scene. He comprehends that this is indeed Eden restored, more lovely now than when he was banished from it. Remember, Adam lived 930 years after he was banished from the Garden of Eden. And he saw it there, and he, but he could not go in ever again. And now here he is in there again. Oh, there's that tree. Oh, there's those flowers. Oh, I remember when I did that. And, it, and it's just like, it's like, he, he realises now that everything's restored. Everything's back the way it should be. The Saviour leads him to the tree of life and plucks the glorious fruit and bids him eat. He looks about him and beholds a multitude of his family redeemed, standing in the paradise of God. Then he casts his glittering crown at the feet of Jesus and falling upon his breast embraces the Redeemer. He touches the golden harp and the vaults of heaven echo the triumphant song, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain and lives again. The family of Adam take up the strain and cast their crowns at the Saviour's feet as they bow before him in adoration. This reunion is witnessed by the angels who wept at the fall of Adam and rejoice when Jesus, after his resurrection, ascended to heaven, having opened the grave for all who should believe on his name. Now they behold the work of redemption accomplished, and they unite their voices in the song of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. One day, if we are faithful, 
we are going to be worshipping Jesus along with Adam. So heaven and Eden restored is the next phase. And the people that are going to give that message, it's not an individual, it is a group. It is a movement. It is a church that God has raised up to give a final warning message to the world to prepare them to stand in the day of God and be taken to heaven to be with Jesus throughout eternity and on this earth after the thousand years. Okay. Jesus said, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So, these people are keeping the commandments of God. And one of the commandments of God is the Sabbath. And in Isaiah 65, verse 17, God says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. And Alan White says, The fire that consumes the wicked purifies the earth. And in Revelation 21, verse 1, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. In the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, it is to be restored more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. In Isaiah 65, 18 and 19, we have this wonderful promise. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Nahum 1 verse 9, it says, He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Praise the Lord. The time has come which holy men have looked with longing since the flaming sword barred the first pair from Eden. The time for the redemption of the purchased possession. The earth, originally given to man as his kingdom, betrayed by him into the hands of Satan, and so long held by the mighty foe, has been brought back by the great plan of redemption. All that was lost by sin has been restored. Amen. God's original purpose in the creation of the earth is fulfilled as it is made the eternal abode of the redeemed. And as I said to many of you before, and some are new, so you never heard this before, or me say this before, but just imagine <clears throat> the longest we can usually live on this earth is at the moment is about 80, 90. If we're lucky, we can get to 100, 110. But Abraham lived to 175. Noah lived 900 years. Plus, <laughs> Methuselah, the oldest man who ever lived, was 969 years. Can we imagine living 969 years? Impossible. Not even a thousand years. The Brun sisters, we're not going to live a thousand years. We're not going to live 10,000 years. 100,000 years, a million years, a billion years, a zillion years, we're going to live for eternity. We're never, ever, ever going to die. Just think of that. That's what Christ has done for us. That's why he died for us, so that we can live forever with him. And, and not only not never going to die, but we don't have to have this body ever again. <laughs> or this mind, or this cough, it's all going to be done away with. This is what Christ has done for you. Don't let his death be in vain for you, brothers and sisters. You know, in Micah 4, verse 8, it says, Unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. And in Psalm 37, verse 29, it says, The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell therein forever. Amen. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. 
one pulse of harmony and gladness beats throughout the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. So do we declare that God is love today? If we are faithful to him, we will say that throughout eternity. Everything we're going to look at, everything we're going to do, everything that God is going to reveal to us is going to show that God is love. So there we have it, brothers and sisters, a new earth. From the new earth that God created 6,000 years ago to the new earth that he's going to create in around about 1,000 years from now, I hope. And in that, that new earth, we're going to keep the Sabbath. For as the new heavens and new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, Shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So we're going to worship God in the new earth and we're going to have the Sabbath. Okay. So here we see the Sabbath being kept from the new earth, from creation, up until the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And then the Bible says, after the thousand years, I mean, from the time we get to heaven, throughout eternity on the new earth, we are going to be keeping the Sabbath. Now, this is my question to any of you who are not Seventh-day Adventists or not Sabbath keepers. Why on earth would Jesus, for 2,000 years, change the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday and then restore it again to, to the Sabbath? Why would he do that? It does not make sense. But we know that the Sabbath has been kept from the time of Jesus, even up until now, throughout the world in many different places by God's people, even though the papacy has tried to destroy it. <coughs> now let's move on. Let's look at these names again. Adam, the first human being ever created. Noah, and I'll, I'll include, e <coughs> excuse me, I'll include Enoch in that as well, and Noah, and Moses, and I also include Abraham, and then John the Baptist, and then John the Apostle. When we look at all these people, we, we recognize them as, as Christians anyway, we recognize them as great men of God. Adam, Noah, Moses, John the Baptist, John the Apostle. <clears throat> very, very important people in the dispensation <coughs> of God's people. And then we get to this person, Alan G. White. Now, if God has put this woman in this position, just like he did with Adam and Noah and Moses and John the Baptist and John the Apostle, should we also <clears throat> regard this, this person as a great person of God, someone that, that God has raised up to give a specific message at a specific time, just like he did <clears throat> with those other prophets? And what about us, God's people today, seven day minutes, the remnant? You know, God has given us a tremendous privilege, brothers and sisters, to give the final message to the world to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus. This is a tremendous privilege that God has given us. <clears throat> Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, going back to um, Alan White, Unfortunately, it's one thing to have non-seven-day events call Alan White a false prophet <clears throat> or say she was some crazy woman and, and things like that, you know. But 
for seven day menace to do that and disregard her writings and call her those things, then, then shame on them, brothers and sisters. God, God has used that woman to give a, an amazing message to prepare us <clears throat> for what is happening in the world today, what is going to happen in the near future, and to help us to prepare to be with Jesus in heaven throughout, and in the new earth throughout eternity. <clears throat> now, what are these three similarities? A prophet foretold the event, and then a specific prophet was raised up at the time of the event. So God showed Adam and Enoch the flood. God raised up Noah. Abraham showed Abraham they would go into captivity and God would deliver them. God raised up Moses and, and so on. And they all worshipped on the Sabbath. So where and when are we to worship God today as we come to a close? Ellen White says, Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire, surrounded by angels, came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot, was born to the holiest, where sat the Father sat. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, representing him as being the high priest, the living high priest. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holy, in the holiest and pray, my father, give us thy spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light and power and much love, joy and peace. So Jesus is now in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And that is where we are to send up our faith and our prayers too. Now, she goes on to say this. I turned to look at the company who is still bowed before the throne. What throne? The throne in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Why? Because they had rejected the message of 1844 and they became Babylon. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. Now, listen to this, brothers and sisters. This is why Alan White says we're not to go to the fallen churches of Babylon to get wisdom and instruction from them and when it comes to doctrine and, and certain things. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. What throne? The throne of the holy place. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it, there was light and much power. So there was some truth, but no love, no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and to deceive God's children. So brothers and sisters, Satan wants to keep the fallen churches deceived as to Jesus' ministry in the most holy place and the truth on the Sabbath and on the mark of the beast and on the second coming of Jesus. He wants to keep them deceived, but he doesn't just want to keep them deceived. He wants to draw back and deceive those who entered into the most holy place experience with Jesus. So Satan is going to use the fallen churches and their doctrines and their teachings to try and draw God's people away from him. So remember that, brothers and sisters. God has given us a specific truth for this specific time. He has raised up a specific prophet to give us a specific message to keep us from Satan's deceptions. And we need to heed those messages, brothers and sisters. So Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment 
with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. We're going to go through many trials as God's remnant church, brothers and sisters, but Jesus' grace is sufficient for us. If we just humble ourselves and, and trust in him and trust in his mercy and his grace and his truth and not to ourselves, as we learned in our Sabbath school lesson this morning, his grace will be sufficient for us. So let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, where Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost to come unto God by him, seeing he ever, laveth, ever liveth to make intercession for us, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we need that in the world today. And Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to as his works shall be. Jesus is coming soon, brothers and sisters. Let us hold him. Let us be faithful. Let us trust in him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love him, and be faithful and obedient to him. And Jesus says, finally, these wonderful promises in Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. For him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and sit down with my father in his throne. Do you want to sit down on the father's throne, on Christ's throne, brothers and sisters? Do you want to see the father face to face and see God face to face? And I can't wait for that day to see Christ and to see the father. What a wonderful experience that's going to be. Jesus says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Thank you for listening to this presentation, brothers and sisters. I pray it's been a blessing. And I pray that we will worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And one day when Jesus comes, we'll be able to worship him throughout eternity and on this earth made new, with bodies made new and hearts and minds in tune with our Heavenly Father. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's um, just kneel or we'll close our eyes. Bit of prayer, and then we'll stop the recording. Now, Heavenly Father, as we have seen the history of our world when it comes to, to your worship, we see, Father, that you have raised up mighty men, men like Moses, Noah, who's fearless before the whole world, even though they thought he was a fanatic, yet he had the message of truth. You stood up with Moses. He went before the most powerful monarch on the earth and said, let my people go. And he said, who is God? Lord, you revealed yourself. And he let your people go. And the Heavenly Father, you sent your son Jesus to represent you to this world, to, to show us who you are and, and your, your amazing love for us. And and who it is that we are to worship in this world. And Jesus died and now he is in the, ascended to heaven and he is worshipping before you in the most holy place, the heavenly sanctuary. And you've given us a message of through John the Apostle to prepare us, to show us the end time events, things that are happening in this world today. And you've raised up a, a woman, Ellen White, to give another message for us, to prepare us to stand in these last days as well, to show us the deceptions of Satan, to show us how, how we are to live in, in our lives, how we are to surrender our souls to you and, and be your witnesses and representatives in this world and to abide in you. 
And Father, if we abide in you and you abide in us, when Jesus comes, then we will be able to abide with you and live with you forever. Mm. Experience that beautiful event. To me, the most, apart from the death of Christ, the most glorious event in the history of this world, when Adam is going to meet Jesus again. And Father, I pray that we'll all be there to witness that day and cast our crowns at your feet and say, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. And finally, be, be standing up and, and be able to see all things new again, all the sin and all the suffering, everything finally over, and live in, with you throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. And we don't know what that's going to, what experiences we're going to have then, but it's going to be nothing. What, what we have on this earth is nothing compared to what that is going to be. So help us to all be there, dear Father, so that we can experience each other's love and we can see each other and be with each other throughout eternity. My prayer in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen.